All right, you know, as we end 2023, it's worth looking back at the impact that organized labor has had. Everything from striking actors to Starbucks employees trying to unionize and, of course, to the UAW negotiating historic deals. So let's bring in Merrick Masters. He's a professor of business at Wayne State University. Merrick, it's great to see you again. And, and I'm glad that you're here as we kind of take a look back at, at 2023, because I also think about what's going to be written and then how you're going to be teaching business classes at Wayne State when you look back at this historic year of unionized labor. Well, uh, thanks for having me. I think it's been a interesting year, certainly speaking. Uh, and also, I think it's been a year of increased labor activism. <clears throat> how I would record it in terms of how favorable it is to labor really depends on a variety of circumstances. But I would take a somewhat more cautious view of the situation if I were looking at it from the perspective of organized labor. And that is, I would say, while they had increased strike activity, it was still a fewer number of strikers involved than there were in 2018 and far fewer than they have at their historical peak. They did get record contracts, at least with the uh, big three, but it's also important to remember that <clears throat> there are consequences to their strikes. And you've already had 4,800 workers laid off at Stellantis and GM, at Blue Cross Blue Shield, and at the Detroit casinos where the UAW was also involved. You had uh, severe job losses before those strikes, and those were relatively long strikes. And you have to ask whether or not there are going to be continued layoffs in those industries in particular. And I would go also and look at the Writers Guild and the Screen Actors Guild. <clears throat> those strikes lasted uh, 100 days and 80 days, respectively. And I would say they garnered modest gains in wages, not overwhelming record gains, I would say, uh, in terms of what you would expect given inflation rates. So when you put that into the perspective, and I'll throw one more factoid out there just to put labor's plight in, in reasonable perspective. In the past year, organized labor uh, organized 92,000 workers via certification elections. That is less than one-tenth of one percent of the workforce. If they're not going to substantially increase that by large orders of magnitude, then they're not going to see much success going forward. Yeah, I, w I wanted to ask you about that. So before we start talking about maybe the impact on what a fair wage is for workers that are not unionized, let's talk about the potential growth of, of the labor movement. Do you think that we're going to see, let's start specifically with autos, you think that we're going to see expansion of unions in other automakers from this? Well, I think they're going to try. They've targeted 13, and those 13 employ about 170,000 workers, which is more than the big three employ. They have had no success historically in organizing them. They have not had success in organizing Tesla. These companies will strongly resist any union organizing efforts, and they have the wherewithal to resist labor pretty aggressively. And once you go out there and say that you're targeting somebody, you put a bullseye on yourself. And so those companies are going to respond to the UAW and tout everything about the UAW's record. And one of the things that UAW suffers from is guilt by association. And people are going to say, look at what happened to the domestic auto manufacturing industry. The high labor contracts, the excessive costs, force the retrenchment in the industry, shedding thousands of jobs. And as Sean Fain pointed out in a recent video, the closure of 65 plants in the past 20 years. What about other employers as they're, as they're watching and, you know, people working for other corporations? Was there anything out of the labor movement in this last year that maybe could impact non-union employees saying, well, maybe their company should raise rates or they should, they should raise their salary and be able to, um, you know, benefit in some sort of way? Well, workers' wages rose, relatively speaking. They were higher in the past year or two than they have been in the recent past. And that's welcome news. But that responded more to market conditions, I think, than to the threat of unionization. Uh, companies were forced with a shortage of workers, and they realized that in order to recruit and retain people, they had to raise wages. Now, I think what you've seen more recently with about a handful of companies in the non-union auto sector raising their wages right after the negotiations with the big three, they did so at that time. 
um, because they wanted to get ahead of the curve and they wanted to raise people's wages and say they were responding to the interests of the workers. And also they want to do that before they might be charged with an unfair labor practice because once a union targets you for organizing and you start raising wages, you can be accused of engaging in unfair labor practice. I think that what you'll see is that there is continuing pressure to raise wages as long as the labor market remains tight. But if unemployment were to increase and the labor market would become looser, then I think you'd see a change situation when it comes to increasing wages. Well, it was a heck of a year. We appreciate your uh, perspective. Merrick Masters, business professor at Wayne State University, thanks so much for joining me. Happy New Year. We'll see you in 24. Happy New Year to you. Thank you for having me. Take care.